Buonasera, greetings from Toronto and greetings from the Global Village. Welcome back, my friends, to the second Monday Night Webinar, Monday Night Webinar series uh, online, live on Facebook and YouTube every Monday night in response to this state of isolation. We wanted to get together to uh, put together our community of friends uh, in the media ecology community in the Marshall McLuhan's Facebook group. Uh, uh, thanks to the generosity of the McLuhan Institute, uh, Andrew McLuhan. Thank you, Andrew. We are also live streaming on YouTube. Okay, so we are live and public on YouTube and in the Facebook group, uh, Marshall McLuhan's Facebook uh, group, a nice community of people. All right, all right, all right, all right. This is Paolo Granata from Toronto, and I have the pleasure of uh, hosting this uh, series of Monday night uh, webinar. Uh, before introducing our uh, special guests for tonight, I wanted to uh, do a little bit of the housekeeping for uh, for uh, our comments, for uh, many other things. So first of all, uh, I see some comments coming from Facebook, but please be reminded that if you want to um, show your name and profile on the comments uh, streaming online, you have to authorize uh, StreamYard, our broadcasting platform, to basically grab your name and profile. So otherwise, you will look like an anonymous uh, comment, so we won't see who you are, okay? And also, I had this idea today. So uh, when uh, commenting, when say hi, say where you come from, where you are, actually, where you are uh, right now and so you can say paolo from toronto or from canada so to show our beautiful uh, global village so because i know there are uh, people uh, watching uh, uh, right now from many many places uh, uh, all across uh, all across the world including one of our guest speakers tonight uh, i'll tell you later i'll tell you later it's a uh, kind of surprise but i think you know already in the meantime i see some friends johnny john smile uh, rodrigo rodrigo verbosa hello robert uh, bob bleachman thank you and welcome back and welcome welcome back uh, you all my friends so it's great it's uh, 8 or 4 in toronto i'm warming up a little bit of housekeeping let me uh, just uh, uh, remind you the mindset for this Monday night uh, uh, webinar uh, series. In an age of uh, lockdown, we wanted to slow down, okay? So I usually rush instead. I don't want to rush for this Monday night webinars. I, will, I like to share some thoughts and ideas and get inspired by you all and our friends and guests. Uh, so lock, lockdown, equal slowing down so i want to slow down a little bit and then also uh i will be in a kind of a multitasking mode uh, because i have to and i want to uh, keep an eye on our comments coming from facebook and youtube and then our speakers i will be moderating i will be asking i will be picking some of your comments and questions uh, into the live stream so uh, feel free to uh, send and com using comments to send your questions, your uh, remarks, uh, your comments, of course. Uh, we want to involve you all, okay? So this is a community. It's not just a, a one-to-many broadcasting, uh, but it's a, it's a pure community of uh, friends and enthusiasts and advocates for exploring our, uh, I call it pandemedia, folklore's from the lockdown, the pandemic, what's going on in our media environment, in uh, this state of isolation, crisis, or opportunities, right? We want to be optimistic. And so that's why our guests will uh, share uh, thoughts and ideas, and then we will explore who we are, what matters to us now in this uh, very, very important uh, moment. So I see other friends, uh, um, Seminario Cyber Culturas, uh, good night from Rosario, Argentina. Thank you, Rosario. Alfonso from Cleveland. 
uh, Ohio. Uh, Facebook user, uh, yes, Nai from Montreal. So authorize StreamYard so we can see your name on it. And uh, 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 who else? So please join, join, join. In the meantime, in the meantime, I'm going to uh, say a few words about the next modern seminars, actually, before getting started, this 8 or 6. Uh, we have a lineup of uh, guest speakers until July. It's all packed. Till July, every Monday night, four guest speakers uh, for you. Uh, um, just let me uh, announce uh, a premiere for next uh, for next uh, Monday night uh, uh, webinar, uh, May 11th, uh, yes, we're going to have Donna Halper, Jesse Hirsch from Toronto, Mark Lipton, and Phil Rose. So a nice uh, lineup uh, of uh, friends and speakers uh, for uh, the next one. So, you know, every Monday night, uh, Monday night webinar to retrieve the Marshall McLuhan's uh, tradition uh, in uh, fostering a dialogue and conversation. We are isolated, but not alone. So we want to get together and we want to foster exchange of ideas, exchange of uh, thoughts, encouragements, and uh, uh, good vibes, right? To reflect on what's going on in our media environment, in our pandemedia, as I like to call it. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, 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 my uh, Andrew, Andrew McLuhan. Hello, Andrew. Andrew was a special guest last week. He said I'll be flipping back and forth, moderating the YouTube feed. Thank you, Andrew. And in fact, Andrew McLuhan and the McLuhan Institute is kindly uh, providing a special uh, um, uh, the YouTube channel for broadcasting live and publicly. Instead, the Marshall McLuhan Facebook group is a private group. But you are invited to to join us if you are uh, following us on uh, youtube you can go on facebook if you are on facebook join the marshall McLuhan's group uh, it's a nice community of about two thousand people really committed to explore the legacy of marshall McLuhan. all right all right all right all right andrew mir uh, kirsten hello everyone i'm excited for another great discussion we are excited to Kirsten, all right. And uh, again, before uh, it's 10, 8 or 9, so just one minute before getting started, uh, again, uh, please feel free to comment. Uh, we want to engage you all. Um, if you wish, you can say, where are you now? So, okay, it's nice to see our global village gathering in the same uh, place. Uh, I wanted also to remind you all, if you didn't yet, to uh, authorize authorize our uh, broadcasting platform StreamYard to grab your name and profile photo uh, if you want to uh, show your name and profile into the live stream or otherwise you look like an anonymous uh, uh, commenter i'll show you i'll show you an example you will look uh, uh like uh, like this okay you see it's a uh, facebook user so it doesn't doesn't look nice instead we want to see real people real face uh, real friends okay so please be reminded that uh, uh, if you didn't do yet if you're following us on facebook uh, just visit streamyard.com slash facebook just authorize um doesn't deal with your privacy settings it's just a name and profile to be grabbed into the stream okay all right all right all right all right all right and i see i see people are connecting and i think it's the it's time to it's time to start uh, let me say hi to alexander alex uh, kuskis uh, selene uh, simari from rosario argentina oh many from argentina great uh, nice to see uh, hello from uh, kilona british columbia james james winstor thank you and welcome james uh, welcome Allison from ottawa welcome online okay 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 and so we are uh, live we are live and we are still alive and there's a uh, uh, pandemia and yes we want to explore uh, how to make sense of this unique uh, 
uh, unprecedented uh, uh, times we are we are living. Um, we want to go beyond uh the um, common discussion about what's going on right now so we have a few uh, special guests uh, to dig deeper into the sense of this uh, uh, media environment in the specific uh, pandemic media and so uh, i have a great pleasure let me first of all uh, uh, let me introduce our first uh, uh, guest speaker for tonight uh, uh, he is an authority back in the 90s he kicked off uh, the very idea of uh, uh, virtual communities uh, uh, smart moms so think be before facebook before any other social media uh, uh, platform uh, he was able to really uh, forecast uh, the idea that the web and internet was going to provide a social space uh, for uh, uh, we all and so uh, it's a great pleasure it's an authority it's a pioneer uh, in uh, in uh, media studies and virtual community studies in uh, in the internet studies i'm going to uh, bring in to the uh, live stream and virtually please join me welcoming with a virtual round of applause howard rangel howard Hi. welcome welcome to the monday night webinars Good to be here. Great, welcome, welcome, welcome. So, um, I'll I like to just make one question, and then I'm going to introduce uh, our uh, your our fellow our fellow guest for tonight. But uh, in this moment, I want to really ask how you are feeling right now. So, how mm, yeah, what was what's the feeling right now in this moment, Howard? Um. I see uh, a crack between the worlds. Uh, the world now is radically different from the way the world was a couple of months ago. And a lot of things are never going to be the same. And, hmm. uh, you know, a lot of that is traumatic. But also, I think it's an opportunity to reform the way some things are done. So I, I am feeling optimistic about the, uh, the opportunity for change that is being presented by this forced change. Hmm. And where are you now? So who you are quarantined with? I'm, I'm in uh, my studio in Mill Valley, California, about 10 minutes north of the uh, Golden Gate in San Francisco. Oh, wow. This was my office for many years when I wrote books and, and taught college students, but I've moved a lot of the books out and moved my art in, so mostly I, I, I make things here out of electronics and, and paint and, and wood. Uh, so... Um, being forced to be here alone a lot of the time is not very different from the way my life has been. If, if you're, uh, I'm sure my other guests know this as well. If, if you're going to be a writer, you are really sentencing yourself to solitary confinement in, in a room with your, your, your words. So um, I'm completely comfortable being alone a lot of the day. Yeah, well, this is uh, impressive, right? To see that uh, you're comfortable in this uh, in, in this moment, and well, I like to say that uh, uh, we are all experiencing uh, something new, right? In terms of uh, even the, this very streaming, right? Uh, uh, before the lockdown, online streamings were the the most uh, boring annoying thing online instead now they are all excited for online streaming so we are rediscovering without taking for granted the solitude of a writer like you said and uh, rediscovering the value of getting together uh, for instance in live uh, stream so thank you thank you thank you howard for uh, for uh, this uh, opening remarks okay 
but uh, I really can't wait to introduce our next uh, our uh, um, other other guests for today. So from California, uh, U.S., let's move to Italy. Let's move to Italy for uh, a globe trotter of the global village, uh, uh, another authority, a pillar of the McLuhan's legacy. On uh, since the since the seventies, I think, uh, an authority in the in, in the field, uh, uh, the one who came up with the idea of a connective intelligence and brain frames and the skin of culture, and I can uh, go on and on and on. I, I told you, globe trotter of the global village, from uh, Belgium to Canada to Spain to Italy right now, and the. I think now he is in a beautiful place in Italy. You will be very jealous, uh, I think. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very, very happy, glad, and pleased to introduce you all our next uh, uh, guest uh, speaker for tonight, Derek de Kirkov. <laughs> Welcome, Derek. Well, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello, 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 hello. How are you? How are you? First of all, where are you? Okay, <laughs> I am in a very beautiful part of Italy, which is called Vico Equense. It's a village, of, well, it's a little town, really, uh, south of Naples, on the other side of the bay. And I, uh, from my office, uh, daylight, I yeah. can see the Vesuvius and the sea uh, right be be see beneath me. And in fact, if I open the windows, you might even hear the sea. So there you are. <laughs> can, I sh can I show that? Uh, now it's night time. And by the way, <laughs> okay. let me point out, it's 2 a.m. My friends in, in Canada, US, it's 2 a.m. in Italy, okay? So uh, it, I really much, much appreciate, uh, Derek, your effort. It's, it's a pleasure. Really, really no, it pleasure. is a lot of fun. You know, we take uh, 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 funny things uh, seriously. And the, the very idea of a Monday night webinar, so this is a deep night for you, right? So it's almost morning. So uh, we take the word night very seriously. <laughs> I can, can I show the, the picture you sent me, the, your uh, outlook? Sure. Your view? <laughs> uh, three, two, so I want to make uh, our uh, friends uh, very jealous. This is what uh, <laughs> daytime Derek uh, is... Uh, as a look at. and let me and um, well uh, so are you alone uh, who you're quarantined with uh, what's your feeling uh, in this moment Derek I am actually with the delightful family uh, with, uh members of family of uh, my, my companion Maria Pia and uh, so it's in the her hotel compound that I am now and uh, the most amazing thing is this this day coincides with the first moment of opening in Italy. As you may know, uh, Italy, like the rest of the world, has been the lot. Well, it's been the longest uh, time under lockdown, a full two months. And uh, so today was the first day. And <laughs> it's kind of fun. It's very Italian. <laughs> All right. Did you, did you go out for a walk? Or, uh, sure, of course I did. Sure, of course. <laughs> I went for a long one. Aperitivo uh, or just uh, no? No, no, no. no. <laughs> no it was good. actually we went we went down a beautiful path to the place we just you've just seen to the to the little uh, port which is just beneath us, and yeah. that's about uh, a good twenty minute walk. Yeah. But uh, but then we also walked into town and you know do things and it, the town was jammed and we didn't see we hadn't seen that for two months which wow. is really a weird thing and he had the police uh, running around saying make sure you stay you know keep your distance <laughs> so we're wow. doing well, yeah. it's very impressive no very impressive I, I i guess people couldn't wait to really really go out and uh, well retrieve the ordinary life so we, well, we, we were talking yeah ordinary but but with the anxiety of keeping your mask on, staying away from people, it you know, it, it's not like before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, it's absolutely like right, absolutely right. And without taking anything for granted, and let me uh, use this comment to show you one of the Marshall McLuhan's probes that I would like to bring on the table uh, to foster discussion, and this is one of my favorite for this moment particularly the future is not what it used to be so i i see that probe as a as a way to not take for granted what our 
expectations for the future. And in fact, we are living in totally unexpected world. We couldn't really figure out. It's completely um, unexpected, right? So that that's really um, fosters my curiosity. And so the future is not uh, what it used to be. What's your comment on this quote, Derek? Well, it's another one by, by Macron which is um, the future of the future is the present. Right. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> well, no, that's actually, I mean it. I mean it because uh, where we are now uh, in this particular situation is, is the virtual relationships taking over from the face-to-face -face one. I mean, during the lockdown, we found, we found a change of proportion. I of see. the time we spend face to face and the time we spent online and what you were saying about us getting together again in this way is actually it's a very nice and encouraging thought about the fact that this is also pleasant this is also you know a real experience but uh, clearly this shift from one uh, uh, mode of being of taking for granted that uh, spatial i mean physical space was the only real one and anything else was borrowed from it well now it's just that is changing that's a good point right right um well we will continue the discussion derek yes of course i want to i want to first say hi to a few friends on uh, facebook uh, brandon Brandon, happy birthday, Finnegan's Wake. Happy birthday, Finnegan's Wake. Uh, that's interesting. I don't know. Then we have Ruthan. Ruthan, great to see you. Paolo, Derek, friends. Thank you. Hello, Ruthan. Uh, Masood, welcome back. Hey, everybody. Hello, everybody. Sorry for being late. No worry. This is very relaxed, okay? So, no problem at all. So, I much appreciate it. Ria, Ria Bermont, uh, she will uh, be one of our uh, next speakers uh, in the following weeks uh, and many others. So, feel free to uh, John Caputo. Hello from Spokane, Washington. Hello, John. Bernadette, welcome back. Bernadette uh, kicked it off last week, uh, Derek. Uh, she uh, kicked it off a series of uh, um, uh, probes. Uh, we started probing and playing with words, uh, of course, uh, pandemic, uh, uh, COVID, and blah, blah, blah. But basically, it was a very creative exercise in playing with words uh, and making our language uh, uh, foster the way we think. So thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Bernadette, for uh, for kicking off last week uh, the probes. And maybe tonight we can keep probing, exploring, and making puns uh, in order to better reflect um, on, uh, on our current scenario. All right, all right, all right. So feel free to comment, my friends, uh, and uh, uh, Thank you, Derek. I'll be back to you. Uh, so the future is coming, no problem. <laughs> the future is coming. And uh, uh, for introducing our uh, next uh, um, speaker for tonight, a friend, another pillar at the McLuhan Center here in Toronto, a long standing McLuhan's collaborator in the 70s, and then uh, a volcanic source of energy and inspirations for the McLuhan's community, for the McLuhan scholarship. Uh, among many other many other uh, um, um, books he wrote about uh, McLuhan and understanding the new media uh, through the lens of uh, Marshall uh, uh, McLuhan. And so please uh, join me, from, uh, welcome with a virtual round of applause from Toronto, Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Logan, Robert K. Logan, even known as Bob. Bob, it's you. Hello, Bob. Hello, Paolo. Hello, all my friends. So nice to see you uh, in New York. Where are you? Good to, good to, glad that you're here. Rodrigo in Brazil. Bon abrigado. Yeah, it's a nice uh, community. Uh, all across the world, all across the world. Uh, I see Argentina, Brazil, Canada, US, uh, Europe, Italy, Derek, and many others. So, Bob, how are you? What's going on uh, in Toronto on uh, the waterfront? <laughs> well, I, I'll give you an image of where I am. Uh, 
on the shores of Lake Ontario, that's the Toronto Harbor. Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, getting a lot of work done, that's for sure. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that perhaps later on. But I want to comment on uh, the future of the future is the present. I hope that the future will change radically from the present situation where we're in lockdown. And uh, I think that the future is going to be completely different than what we knew before COVID. I think what we learned from this experience is we don't need to consume as much as we used to. I have a very uh, happy life, even though I'm uh, confined to the shores of Lake Ontario. I don't have to zoom all around the world to find pleasure. So maybe we'll learn that we don't have to consume as much in order to enjoy life. And we have to prepare ourselves for the next crisis that will face our community, which is the climate change and global warming. And this is just a prelude, this experience with COVID, for what's coming next. And uh, it won't happen for 20, 30 years from now, but we should learn from this experience that really bad things can happen. And people that have denied climate change and denied global warming cannot be listened to anymore. Donald Trump told us, oh, the COVID would be nothing. Well, it turned out to be a disaster, more of a disaster for the U.S. and other places because of his cavalier attitude towards it. So I hope we learn from this experience. Sorry yes. to be so serious, but that's no, no. my job. <laughs> I think we share the same uh, hopes. We share the same uh, uh, visions for the future. So we we are learning, right? We are learning every day. We are learning something new from this unexpected uh, situation. And so we are uh, learner animals, right? So we, we can learn very fast, I think, uh, from this uh, situation. So thank you for pointing this out, for bringing this out. And uh, we'll be back on, on this. And uh, so thank you. Thank you again for joining us uh, Bob, a few a few other um, uh, housekeeping before uh, going ahead. Uh, 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 Andrew uh, Derek Dekerkov was a translator, French translator of from cliche to archetype. And so I wanted to uh, remind us uh, again a few friends: Steve uh, Hicks. Uh, Joel, best wishes, Derek uh, from Joel, uh, Bernadette again, uh, Andrew, and so on. So thank you all. Thank you, all my friends. I don't see Clinton, Ignatov, Clinton uh, generously uh, provided uh, a way to uh, invite tonight uh, uh, Howard uh, Rangel. So, Howard, I wanted to uh, go back to you and, um, and um, well, I'm curious to not only well, ask you a few uh, things about what you are uh, researching the most right now in this particular situation. But we started thinking and talking about the idea of how this uh, brand new situation is impacting the field of uh, education, e-learning, online learning, uh, a new kind of uh, pedagogy is emerging in this uh, unexpected scenario. So what's your take on uh, on on this? Well, um, that's one I like to think about. Since I've said something, should I put some earphones on? Oh, it's getting some echo. OK. Yeah, yeah um, well, let's do the where it's going. Right, go ahead. That's something that I, that I know about, because I, I taught online for, for 10 years, and uh, also uh, blended learning, where I, I taught face to face with college students in a, a, a classic college uh, classroom, but also uh, online. Uh, but I've noticed a couple of things uh, from from my experience that I think are, are opportunities that that come from the situation that we're we're forced into. One is all of these conferences where thousands of people fly thousands of miles to to meet for three days. And I've gone to a lot of those because uh, I spent years speaking uh, at them. And, and I know that these gatherings are communities. And 
they're a way for people to get in touch with each other. And it's not just about hearing the speaker. It's about the serendipitous meetings in the, the hallway. But um, but now uh, some folks are, are, are forced to have uh, virtual conferences. And so uh, I think it's never going to replace that experience. But every conference where you replace thousands of people flying thousands of, of miles to, to meet in person is, is going to have a, a beneficial impact on on the, the amount of carbon we put into the atmosphere. I think it would be a good thing if after the lockdown is over that some of these conferences were, were held virtually. Um, also, okay, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that if you, you want, but the online learning part, I think it's important to make uh, the distinction that uh, a lot of, of teachers are not really doing online learning. What they're doing is they're they're forced to teach their curriculum through online media because they can't meet in person, and uh, it's not the same thing. And uh, it's not their fault. Uh, I do think that. Teaching online can be as enriching or more enriching, uh, particularly with a group like this who are who can't be co-located, who are from every part of the world. Uh, but you need to really know how to do it. And it's really as much a matter of pedagogy as it is a, a matter of technology. And if you reproduce the the pedagogy of a classroom where Everyone knows where to sit and everybody knows who's silent and who's speaking and who's in charge uh, with the, the same kind of curriculum online. It's, it's going to be st stressful and, and boring. Uh, however, um, if uh, whether you're in a face to face classroom or you're online, you move to more of a co-learning environment in which the students are co-teaching as well. And it's not just the, the professor talking on, giving a lecture that might as well be on, on YouTube, but uh, something that, that affords us to, to use uh, media that aren't available in the classroom. Uh, I found using online asynchronous forums in between face-to-face -face meetings, for example, enabled us to to extend the kind of conversation that you want to break out in a classroom over a period of a week, enable people to really think about it and dive into it. And quite often you find that the people who are in a face-to-face -face classroom who are awfully quiet uh, come out of their shell if uh, they have an opportunity to think about it without everybody staring at them. So. I know a lot of people are using Zoom to just try to do what they do in the classroom in, in a, a, on a, a video medium, but uh, the, the video media are really just part of the, of the mix. Uh, universities uh, have not really been terribly interested in this. In fact, when, when I started teaching at, at Stanford around 2005, before the word social media were really used, I was asking my students to use forums and blogs and wikis uh, as as part of our work and i noticed that not that many other teachers were using them and when i asked uh, the person in charge of their center for innovations and learning he said well that that's an easy answer this is a a knowledge factory and uh, teachers are hired here really because of their work in their field their, their publications their inventions uh and there's not if they don't if they're supposed to teach and they don't show up in the classroom then that could be a problem, but there are no real positive incentives mm. for that kind of pedagogy. And so, you know, we, we need the, the research universities. That's, that's where a lot of the big breakthroughs happen. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but when I started looking around for other innovators in digital media and learning, I, I found them at, at small liberal arts colleges that, in, in which teaching and not research was really the, 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 the main thing to do. So I don't think that, uh, I think universities are in economic trouble as are a lot of other institutions and 
online learning, I think, is, isn't going to replace them. But I think that there's a particular pressure uh, now, because we're forced to do it, to explore what's useful about uh, online media. So, yeah. it's, no, it's, that's a, that's a absolutely a great point. But may, can I make a question? So, rightly, uh, uh, my, our friend Alex uh, Kuskis, uh, the mind behind the. Um, um, McLuhan Galaxy blog, rightly Alex said uh, uh, online uh, learning has been a new pedagogy for over 40 years. That's right. But why, my question for you, for you, Howard, why we were not prepared? So it, it's true, you are a pioneer in this and many other pioneers. So, so it's uh, since 40 years ago, we started thinking and practicing uh, uh, online pedagogy in e-learning and so on. But why now in 2020, we were not prepared? Well, you know, I think a, a lot of what's been called online learning was really just transferring what, what happened in the in the face-to-face -face classroom to online media. You know, as has been, been said about previous media, um, and as M McLuhan noted, in the early years of new media, they, they quite often uh, imitate old media. So, you know, before the close-up and the tracking shot and the uh, and montage, the other aspects of cinema as we know it came, came about because of, of people who wanted to use the new technology to do things that they couldn't do in, in old uh, drama. Um, they just nailed a, a, a camera to the stage and, and did what they used to do in plays, but did it on film. And I, I think uh, a lot of that has to do with a, a shift that, that some people, Paulo Freire, um, uh, John Dewey, uh, have, uh, Vygotsky, have talked about for a long time as kind of a minority in, in which the what, what Freire called the, the banking theory of learning, the professor's got some knowledge and, and I'm going to transfer that from my head to your head to more of a, a co-exploration, a, a um, co-interrogation um, uh, of, of the subject matter in which the, the, the students have more agency in the, in the learning. And you know, you said before, we are really creatures who are optimized for learning. Um, a lot of the teaching that goes on in a classroom or uh, online is more teaching than, than learning. Uh, you know, except for a few autodidacts, if you wanted to learn most things until very recently, you, you had to go to school. Uh, schools had a monopoly on learning. But for some years now, we've had the web, we've had Wikipedia, we've had uh, YouTube, you know, you, if you've got a teenager around, ask them how they would learn to play a ukulele or, or configure a web server, and they will probably tell you that they would do a search on YouTube, and we'd probably yeah. find another teenager who would teach yeah. them. So that monopoly is no longer there. The expertise of a great teacher is still valuable, but people can learn and do learn on their own. So I started a project called Pyragogy. A while back, if you if you look it up, p e e r a g o g y dot org, you will see that a a whole community of uh, educators have put together a handbook for people who want to use the tools that are available to us to learn the things we want to learn, whether or not there is an expert teacher or or institution in charge. So we now have this possibility and these tools. What's what's really not as widespread is the is the lore, the knowledge about how do you go about doing it well. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's very impressive and a great point. Uh, let me uh, sum up this way. So we are learning how to learn. So how to learn is more important than uh, other things, particularly right now. And I was curious to uh, bring in uh, Derek, which is actually teaching right now. I think. Uh, uh, a, an online uh, course in China, Italy. So you, you are in the midst of uh, a, an 
experimentation uh, all across the world with e-learning. So what's your take on this? So are we learning uh, how to learn again? Absolutely. And I think that everything that uh, Howard was saying is extremely pertinent about the fact that uh, we have to reinvent teaching if we're going to use this medium. And I think uh, that's exactly what you're doing, uh, Paolo. And uh, I'm trying myself to do that in China, uh, dealing with a very different culture and a very different language is, is, a, is a challenge of its own. Um, I'm using Google Translate to do presentations that uh, actually I want to make sure that my students understand. And um, of course, I have, I have to have them checked by the people who are, are running the course out there. But I have found it extremely interesting to, to do this. I, find it, I'm, I like very much the fact that uh, you deal one-on-one -on -one in a way you can't in a normal class. Like the way we, I was just thinking, uh, seeing Howard, it was like the, the big privilege that if you are at the ball game, you can actually you know, see the player push the ball, which yeah, you right. couldn't if you were sitting in the back, you know. So there is, a, there is an advantage to have this relationship. And you, you find that you, of course, if you're dealing with a very large class, it's the same old problem. But if you have 20 students or 25 students, which is my case, then you can really relate to each one of them on a normal sort of during the class basis, as opposed to have to wait for the, you know, visiting hours and so on. So the relationship between the teacher and student is changed as well. And uh, it, the access, the mutual access is in, encourages um, using the opportunity in, in a much better way than the old days. So I, I find that's very, very positive. Um, and, and, and of course, what I am experimenting with them is to create a MOOC on um, how to look at how to look at uh, paintings because it's a school of you know it's it's the Central Academy of Fine Arts in in Beijing, mm -hmm. and so I I immediately threw them some McLuhan, uh, told them about the figures of rhetoric. Uh, we are now analyzing advertising and comparing advertising to uh, traditional painting or, or co uh, actual uh, uh, painting in order to figure out what are the the, the same. Uh, figures of rhetoric that are being used uh, in both. And what's interesting is that there, the way that people are teaching art there, and I guess that's a movement that's starting a bit everywhere, it's that uh, they don't say, you know, plastic art anymore. They say visual culture and visual culture as communication. So that the issue of communication has become, prime, you know, priority priority for studying art, that an art piece is not just a standalone doing thing on its own. It has a huge context that's or we, any, any scholar would know this, but, but it also has an intention and uh, it, that intention can only be decoded by, uh, you know, looking at it in a very different way, looking at it as a piece of communication and not simply as More focus kind of on ornament. The, yeah. yeah kind of semiotic uh, approach, yeah. right, Suzanne? So, so, so we're making a book of comparing this. And I dealt with McLuhan's teaching. I had this wonderful, you, know, you remember the uh, four levels of, uh, of uh, biblical exegesis? You know, uh, the, 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 the uh, literal level, mm. the allegorical level, the tropological level, and getting, so I was very keen on how Marshall t taught us to look at these things. Uh, and of course, the five parts of rhetoric that uh, uh, Kikero was uh, uh, using for, for talking publicly and so on. So it's a lot of fun to review yeah. these uh, traditional approaches, which yeah, were classics. very rich, the classics, and then come and adapt them to a very modern situation. Yep. Yeah. Um, amazing. Absolutely impressive. And uh, it came uh, here. Uh, from Daniel uh, uh, McGowan, uh, perhaps we need a better mental model of what learning could look like online. Howard, your uh, your take on this, a mental well, model. Uh, I think the mental model that an awful lot of people have right now is that is you, you do a, a, a video stream session um, that's mostly lecture, but there are 
all sorts of other tools that en enable a, a group to learn together. Um, for example, social bookmarking or annotation, where a group of, group of people um, can annotate a text online uh, where the individual contributions add up. So, you know, if you think about weaving together um, maybe a, a short presentation, I, I really don't think that a lecture online is any good for more than 10 minutes, but something in which you, you enable the, the learners to see what, it, what the landscape is and then invite them to go out and find some, some resources and bookmark those and have discussions about those resources and then to you know guided by the teacher perhaps hone in on a, on a couple of the, the texts that the students have come up with uh, by themselves and then annotate those texts find the, the, the passages that speak to you and and talk about why they speak to you so you know that this is something of course that that you could could do in a face-to-face -face classroom but it's but the affordances of it online are, are much uh, easier so to me the, the model has to do with mixing synchronous and asynchronous media but also with a mix of the the teacher setting out the the landscape defining what the reality is that you're going to explore and uh, enabling the, the, the students to come up with the questions and the answers that you could give them, but um, they could more effectively, I think, find on their own. So I, I call it co-learning, and I, I began to ask my, my students to co-teach with me. <laughs> which, uh, That's good. A group of, you know, at the beginning of the, of the quarter, I would write the themes for each week uh, on the board, community, social capital, whatever we would be exploring a group of texts around for a week. And then I asked the students to gather around uh, the part of the whiteboard where that, that spoke to them the most. And the, the, the groups that gathered around the themes, those were the co-teachers. And we talked about them taking up about a third of the class time, uh, finding what was important to them and trying to engage the other learners in, in uh, finding out why they felt it was important. So, you know, again, this is not new. I, I didn't invent this. Uh, others uh, in the online world didn't really invent it. It really comes from a, you know, c kind of theory of, of participation uh, of the more agency from the student. There's a, a good book that I discovered while I was doing this by John C. Lee Brown and Doug Thomas called A New Culture of learning that broke out the different aspects of it. So again, I think if you, you, you see what I'm, I'm talking about, the, the pedagogy really comes first and then you can use the various tools to, to fit into that. And, and because of the nature of the tools, you really need to, to come up with something that's quite a bit different from the normal um, reading lecture and text format. Great. There you, know, you wanted yeah, to respond, I, right? No, I just wanted to remind Howard that when he came to the recruit program, and I can't remember what year that was, that was the that was literally the month during the, which social bookmarking had been discovered. And you and Joy Ito were actually wow. having a lot of fun about it. <laughs> you were so pleased. I can remember that. You had to shoes of different colors and you were dancing. <laughs> yeah, I can't, a lot of these things have been around for a while. No, I know it has, but that was the time it had been born. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, how are the? Do you used to attend the McLuhan Center for a, for a while? Came was <laughs> back in the uh, I, in the nineties. I I visited once in the nineties. Once in the nineties. Um, what happened? That yeah. was. <laughs> And then I, I came again to Toronto to talk to Bob Logan um, about uh, some of his ideas for uh, a book I was writing uh, called Mind Amplifiers. Uh -huh. And so, Bob, uh, can you confirm? Uh, <laughs> no, I was just kidding. Yes, <laughs> I can confirm. I nice have a time with Howard. Yeah, nice that we you finally uh, got together again after after many years. Yes, That's Howard, great. throwing you a kiss. 
<laughs> great, great. And so I wanted to grab some comments from the audience. And by the way, so let me just remind that if you want to show your name and profile in on the comments, you have to authorize the StreamYard slash Facebook. Otherwise, you will look like an anonymous user. So we want to see your face and real uh, people there. So there are a few comments, uh, I think, uh, um, worth uh, uh, commenting. And by the way, so folks, uh, uh, feel free to uh, put uh, your uh, your questions on the table, okay? So our guests would be very happy to, to take your questions. So feel free and step in with questions or comments or provocative uh, uh, probes or plans. I'd like to respond to Clinton Ignatov's remark about autodidacticism. Go, go ahead, go ahead, Bob. Um, I, uh, I've created two uh, resources for people that want to learn on their own. So online learning can be about a uh, class, classroom situation with a lecturer, but people can do a lot of learning on their own by making use of uh, YouTube, for example, videos. Uh, let me describe two projects that I've, I've been working on. Uh, one of them is a revival of the McLuhan uh, journal explorations that he did with Edmund Carpenter. I see. Yeah, the exploration journal. Uh, right. So uh, a group of uh, now over 70 people from all across the world have joined the editorial board of New Explorations, which is uh, a revival of the McLuhan Carpenter original journal Explorations, which ran from 1953 to 1972. One of the things that we are uh, able to bring to the readers of our journal, which has not yet come out, but is due out any, any sometime in this month of, of May, uh, working with the uh, people at the uh, Rare Brook Library, the Fisher Rare Brook Library in Toronto, I was able to get all of the issues of exploration uh, from 10 to number 32 uh, online now. So anybody that wants to look at the exploration journal that ran from 1960 through 1972, they're now available to people online. And this is one of the articles that will appear in our journal, New Explorations. Uh, one can learn a lot by looking at these old issues of explorations. The second project that I'm working on is called, um, is a catalog of McLuhan videos with at least I have, a, I have cataloged now 160 items of videos of Marshall lecturing or responding to interviews or sitting on a panel. And a lot can be learned by listening to, listening and watching Marshall lecturing or being interviewed. Uh, one learns things that are different than when than what get one gets from reading McLuhan. Because Marshall speaking is another animal from Marshall writing. The uh, oral medium was a natural medium for him. And some of his most brilliant ideas have come through his interviews, his lectures, and his panel discussions. I have a, I've been maintaining a collection of what I call McLuhan zingers one-liners that I think are uh, sum up ideas in just a few words. And what I've discovered by looking at all these videos of Marshall is that many of his most uh, memorable quotations were not written, but they were something that he uh, spoke, spoke about in uh, either a lecture or an interview or on a panel. So, uh, Uh, 
Yeah. Those oh, are major my contributions to uh, self-learning. And uh, I urge people to uh, look at these uh, videos. You can find lots of them just by going to YouTube, which is how yeah. I compiled most of my uh, catalog. Yeah, I see. And uh, no, thank you, Bob. And it's nice that you are... Uh, retrieving the very idea of uh, uh, exploration and uh, i'll take advantage of this very uh, dense uh, and intensive uh, word uh, that uh, marked the whole marshall mcclellan's career uh, for a final question to howard because i know he he has to he has to leave uh, shortly so um, howard uh, uh, what's your exploration right now what are you exploring right now what's the uh, the thing you are uh, researching the most right now in this moment? Well, you know, I like to do things that I I, I didn't know before. Um, so, you know, on the theme of, of learning. So I've been a, a painter uh, my whole life. Um, my mother was an art teacher and her, her philosophy was that we are all artists and that we all have a a need and, and pleasure in expressing ourselves creatively, but most people get shut down when they're quite young. Usually someone looks over your shoulder and says, well, you can't draw, um, don't, don't think of being an artist. To, to me, art is a, really a conversation with myself and a conversation with the, the universe. Uh, but I, I've been interested lately, and you can see the, what's going on with the lights behind me and the, the relationship between radiated light you know, as in a colored LED and, and reflected light, which is what happens when you, you put pigment on a canvas. Um, there's something called an Arduino now, which is a, a tool that was created uh, by some some educators in, in Italy to enable sure. uh, art artists to make uh, art that, that interacts, that has, has lights and sounds, and, and you can wave your hands at it. Um, without being an engineer and inexpensively. So uh, this, there's a whole maker world around the, the Arduino and other uh, microprocessors. And what's really interesting is that this is a new territory that, that people expo are exploring in the arts. So I'm really interested in that relationship between art and technology. And uh, there's just a lot more to learn there. Yeah, I see. I see. And this is absolutely uh, great. And I wanted to, uh, I'm, I'm not sure you're, uh, you can read uh, one comment from Facebook. Uh, Ellie, Ellie Daniel, yes, we are all artists. So, and I think even the example of uh, Arduino, right, as a technology uh, able to foster the creative thinking, uh, the artistic thinking, uh, um, in, in, well, in, in a very uh, effective way. So we need a te more technology to foster uh, our imagination and creativity, right? But aren't we seeing really an explosion of creative expression from all of these people who are stuck at home and they're bored and they're, they're making videos and showing them to the world or they're, they're making uh, masks and they're, they're selling them uh, to people. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of creativity happening out there that wasn't happening before. One, one thing before I, I go that I, I wanted to emphasize is that I see another opportunity coming from the situation we're forced into, which is that, that people are, are forced to interact online now. And I would like us to take that opportunity to try to, to grow out some green space outside the enclosures of, of Facebook and, and uh, 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 YouTube. Uh, you know, th this whole online culture really came about from a lot of enthusiasts. It wasn't really built by governments or by big companies, although they're now involved. Um, and it goes back quite a ways. You know, Usenet in, in the 1980s had um, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people in, in more than 100 countries having asynchronous conversations online long before we could do this video or, or, or audio online. Um, Facebook has taken what is it, like a third of the world, and convince them that the way that they can relate socially is through this narrow template that 
that Facebook affords. But you know, there are, are all kinds of ways to make blogs and and forums and chat rooms and and video rooms of your own. Um, we've lost a, a great deal of conviviality because in these massive online social media, um, the the trolls have a, an advantage. They can they can seize our attention and and present all kinds of ugliness. Uh, in the olden days, you, yeah, sure, there were trolls, but you had lots of places you could go. You, it wasn't just the metropolis. You had yeah. villages. And I think we should take this opportunity to, to rebuild those, to, to, to build on the, 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 the chats we're having with our neighbors and, and online and the other things that we're doing because we're forced to do it. I don't think we're going to be uh, overthrowing Facebook any day soon, although that would be nice. But I do think we can grow some of this green space outside of their enclosure. The green space outside. So that's very interesting. And I, I grabbed the Tyler Newman comment. Any suggestions for good social bookmarking, Howard? Any suggestions for good social well, bookmarking? Well, some people think it's kind of old school, but but I, I really like Digo, D-I-I-G-O. Uh, has a, a lot of things you can do besides just bookmark um, and you can do things in groups and you can annotate in groups and for annotation there's hypothesis uh, <coughs> which is spelled funny the way things on the internet are but they have a whole uh, curriculum for educators to use uh, and you know i've written about this I, I i i do my writing on patreon i moved out of of facebook and into to Patreon, and about half of what I publish there is available uh, to the to the public. And I, I wrote okay. something about social bookmarking. So it's patreon.com slash Howard Rangel's one word. Great, great. So thank you for uh, uh, reminding. And before uh, let you go, Derek, uh, 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 and and actually, I, I wanted to make a formal invitation. So uh, I want you, uh, Howard. Uh, coming back to Toronto as soon as possible. Maybe Derek uh, will join us from uh, from Italy or wherever. Uh, sure. Bob uh, as well. So can you promise yeah. right now online, publicly, Howard, that you will be back to Toronto someday? You uh, you know, one of the great uncertainties is, is whether and how much people are going to be getting on airplanes for international yeah. flights uh, and Personally, that's not a bad thing. I, I, I like the places that I go and I like the people that I meet there, but increasingly the process of air travel has become so dehumanizing. Um, right. And now it's now it's scary. So maybe when it's not frightening to get into a, an enclosed tube full of, of people coughing their viruses, that people will start traveling internationally again. Um, All right. Oh, in which case, I would be delighted to come to the tour. We have to get back to international flights. My wife is in Romania. I'm pining away here in Toronto without her. However, uh, Howard, we are all here together on the same uh, uh, virtual global village in this virtual community, right? By the way, so the, even the Marshall McLuhan's uh, group, uh, to some extent, uh, is a virtual uh, community. So thank you very much, Howard, for uh, joining us tonight. Thank you very Bye, much, Howard. For, uh, for, uh, see you again. And again, and hope, hope to see you soon uh, online, offline, uh, and uh, we'll catch up very soon. Okay. Thank you very much, Howard. Thank you, thank you Howard. Thank you thank you, thank you. thank you. Thank you. You had a great influence on me. Yeah, but I think even my own generation, my own generation, uh, uh, all, uh, for instance, uh, Rangel's uh, books were uh, translated uh, into Italian, French, and many other uh, uh, European languages. So I think uh, uh, his influence was very, very effective in the 90s, again, so as a pioneer in that, uh, in that field. And so um, I wanted to just remind... Uh, uh, I don't want to bore again, but remind to authorize StreamYard because, for instance, I got a comment here from a, a person who uh, said, 
Mm, not sure why my comments are not showing up. So comments are not showing up automatically. Are there some guidelines explaining how this works for discussion? Yes, the only guideline is to authorize a stream yard to grab your face and profile so we can see who you are facebook users uh, not sure why my comments uh, are not showing up so again so this is a very friendly community so no guidelines uh, except the curiosity of uh, sharing thoughts uh, and possibly even questions for our speakers so first of all don't remind, don't don't forget to authorize the stream yard, and so you all are very welcome. Uh, are very welcome, folks, to to join us for this discussion. However, I wanted to. Uh, okay, now it's a little bit more intimate. Bob, Derek, Paolo. Okay, <laughs> let me slow down because I tend to rush. I'm going to slow down. I I wanted to show you a picture which is not the beautiful uh, outlook of, out of uh, Derek's uh, home in Italy, but this is a, a kind of nostalgic memory from the 70s. Here you see, this is a beautiful, smiling, diverse and candid community at the McLuhan Center, I think uh, 70s, uh, you may notice on top left uh, the guy there, uh, it's uh, Bob, of course, uh, Bob Logan, and uh, uh, yeah, a nice group of people. So what's your... Uh, may, I, may I identify some of the other people, Paolo? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Go left to right, on top and then back. Uh, as you go away from me towards Marshall, the fellow there uh, is Carl Scharf. He is a blessed memory. He interviewed Marshall, and I have captured his video with Marshall, and uh, I will share it with this group. As we move along, the only other, other person I can identify is Tom Cooper. Marshall has his arm around Tom Cooper. Uh, standing next to Tom Cooper is somebody I recognize, but I can't come up with his name. Also, the Indian lady is also someone whose name I cannot come up with. As you can see, back in those days, we had lots of hair. <laughs> I see, I see. And uh, thanks to COVID, I'm beginning to look like a hippie once again. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. Someone said that my hair has grown. Yo, your hair looks beautiful compared to mine. Look at this mop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's... that's, uh, that's, that's While I have the before... Um, I am not able to uh, make messages uh, like other people. And I wanted to, if Paulo, you could uh, put my email address up on the, uh, on the, on the Facebook uh, page there so people could see my uh, email address so that they can contact me. And I'd be happy to share with them the uh, uh, the links to the issues 10 through 32 of explorations that Marshall edited. And I would also be happy to send them uh, the catalog of videos that I have created. So is it possible you could put my email address up there? I had a very positive response from Alfonso Williams and Clinton Ignatov. And uh, uh, also, yeah. Masood Eskandari has volunteered to help with the uh, journal. And I'd like you, if you could put up my email address so those people could contact me. Sure, absolutely. I'll, uh, I'll put it on. I'll put it on. I just do paste, copy and paste. Well, uh, for those that are listening, my email address is logan, L-O-G-A-N, at physics.utoronto.ca. All right, here we are, Rodrigo. So, oh, thank you, Rodrigo. Yeah. Yeah, Buon obrigado. But, you know, it's on Google. So you just Google Bob Logger, you will find it uh, in a second. In a second. So um, now that you have an email address, folks, send me your request. 
I'll send you the links to the hidden explorations and I'll send you the uh, catalog of videos so you can watch Marshall and do some online learning autodidactically. Right. Thank Wait. you for that commercial. Uh, no, no, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Derek, I wanted you to comment, uh, uh, because we are, uh, we just entered into a, uh, a memory mode, okay? It's a memorial mm. memory, a nostalgic mode, uh, just for a, few, for a second, then we will be back. What's your take on this question? Can you see the people there? It's another smiling, uh, it's another smiling uh, uh, group photo at the McLuhan Center. Uh, dun, dun, dun. George Thompson. Uh, it's I, I see Thompson in the back, uh, but it's very difficult to see. Yeah, yes, it's very small. small. It's very small. It's very small. And uh, all right, all right, all right. So I have a few. Um, I, I wanted to retrieve two things so that we uh, left behind. Firstly, the kind of environmental uh, uh, impact uh, of this uh, uh, state of emergency. Uh, environmental impact it means uh, rethinking the way we uh, think about uh, sustainable development uh, using technologies for fostering sustainable development uh, and using, uh, ar uh, using arts and, and culture to foster a new uh, awareness uh, on uh, how can we actually uh, make a different future for our for our society. So what's your sense, uh, Derek and then Bob, what's your sense of uh, how we can take advantage of this situation to learn, as we said, and possibly change the direction uh, uh, towards uh, our sustainable future? Well, you know, it's a question that I have been addressing now practically every day uh, by interviews and things that happen. There's a lot of solicitation about that. Uh, and I came to this conclusion. I'd like to preface this by saying what I'm going to say can shock people because it seems that I'm making light of the suffering that people have gone through. And I certainly am not. I realize that each person and each family of person that has gone through the hell of coronavirus has to be first taken account of. Once that said, I almost, I'm almost afraid to say it, but once that said, if you take this, the whole of humanity, which is globalized now, I mean, for the first time in the history of globalism, we are now incapable of denying that we are part of the same space. In the condition of globalism and of global society, you are invited to consider the, the whole of human presence on the earth as a single body. And then suddenly you are looking at coronavirus in a very different way. Coronavirus could be a vaccine or vaccine, I don't know how you say it. In other words, the speed at which we were running to our death in relation to the economy and its complete disregard of the environment, it took a whole new generation to remind us uh, to, that this was the real danger. I think that people, and Bob mentioned this before, but I think that people have been forced to recognize that for being blocked at their own place, not hearing or smelling cars, uh, finding out that dolphins were actually going to the waters around Venice, uh, finding that uh, the air was absolutely pure in places where they've forgotten what it was like. I mean, today when I <laughs> went out, <laughs> a car went by and I had forgotten that smell. It was really amazing. So people have recognized during their, a lot of people have recognized during the, the lockdown that the weather had actually changed or rather that the atmosphere had really changed. And I think that the idea of coronavirus as a vaccine is like really creating uh, the kind of social response. It's very haphazard. 
It's not complete in any way. It's surprisingly disorganized, in fact, when you think about all countries, instead of collaborating, retreating each in their own methods and in their own thing, having difficulty to be Europe <laughs> in a very European way. It's, it's, it's something quite disheartening. But at the same time, at the same time, there is a body reaction to the threat. The threat has killed a lot of people already. It's, it's unimaginable. But the social body, in a disorganized way, and would stay disorganized, many countries are simply going the way the United States are, with one stage respecting the lockdown, the other one, you know, taking their guns to the city hall to, <laughs> to make it stop, which is incredible. But th this is the point. The point is, let's take a view of the coronavirus as a vaccine that actually is going to keep, pe make people really pay attention to the real danger. By comparison to uh, the threats of the, uh, the environment, the climate change, coronavirus is nothing. It's really very small, but it has that effect that is pushing us to recognize. Now, what's going to happen? I've just seen the people coming out in the streets for the first day here in Italy. Great, fun, I enjoyed it. I was happy to see that, although I found it all a bit nervous. But they're going to fool around because it's the nature of people. People just fool around as soon as they, they are free. So we are going to have idiotic. We don't even know why governments do open it. It's almost, you know, there's no, there's no logical, scientific or rational approach to the fact that people are opening it. Yes, they're opening it because they need to save the economy. What economy? Do we want to go in that direction again? Absolutely not. But we will. Why? Because we have too many Trumps and Bolsonaros around. But what's going to happen is that we will have a second wave. I'm almost certain we will. It's going to be worse than the first two. Wait, it was in, 2018, uh, in uh, 1918 with the so-called Spanish flu. Uh, so what is, going to, what is going to happen when we get hit again? Then we are going to change. Right now, the planes still flow. You should go. There is an app that tells you which of the flights are in the, in, in, the, uh, in the air right now. Tons of them. Tons of them, all going north, in fact, very little going south. But the point is, that's exactly what we're doing. We're going to go back just as business as usual. We'll do it again. We'll be hit again. And the second time, we'll get it. I see. I see. And, and what's your take in, uh, in terms of uh, how we can better learn in using uh, um, online platforms uh, to, to well to better achieve what you said so rethinking the way we engage with social media after the pandemic after the lockdown and well maybe a, any game so that's my take your what's your take so well, my, how we can learn to use the social media in a different way no social media we can't run social media social media run us <laughs> so it's a terrible situation. I think we have to consider the whole issue of the economy because it's obviously the balance between health and economy is one. And I'll get to social media, but I mean, I want to come up with this particular theme because it's very key. The balance between economy and uh, health and the sort of, you know, the fact that some people say, well, it's not really that important to have so many dead as long as we get, you know, all the rest really alive. Well, how do we change it? How do we do that? Then social media become very key. How do we actually spend our time uh, at home in our desire online? Hmm. <laughs> our desire to buy or, or I mean, much better getting yourself being served at home than actually running around in uh, to, to vary. There's so many good reasons to actually do work from home, but then we have to develop two things. One, for those who have the means to do this and the education or the skills to actually use uh, social, not social media, but just online relationships and make a living of it, all writers, for example, uh, yeah. happy that for them. But for the other ones, then a completely new understanding of what economy really is should be brought into the play. Yes, give them a minimum salary to survive. Yes, yes. To survive is just like health. It's just a bit more hmm. than that's what I'm saying. We have to we have to change our we have to change our values profoundly. Yes, yes. And understanding this, differently. 
On this point, uh, uh, Andrew McLuhan uh, brought back another comment from YouTube. Uh, Stephen say the right. Maybe it's time for humans to take a break from yes, production where those our lungs start and air begin. Yeah. No, no, it's absolutely clear. And, and I think that it is something that people are going to, it's something that grows. It's not there yet. You can see it incipient. You can, you can feel the feel. And it's wonderful that we have been stopped. The economy has been stopped in its tracks. The insane uh, devaluation of money it has been stopped in its tracks. You can see the houses in Toronto coming down very fiercely and, and very strongly. <laughs> no, no, but of course, because it's mad. Because yeah. it's mad. The, the, the whole investment, the whole capitalism, which is fundamentally not such a bad thing, it has gone to such extremes that it's destroying the rest. It's a malady now where it was a mode of survival that was sort of more or less evenly distributed between workers and owners. Suddenly it's become non-owners who are actually making insane, obscene fortunes, letting everybody else down. No, I'm, I'm very happy that a few, you know, donors like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and, and, uh, some are actually saying, oh, they're looking at the very Bill Gates is somebody who's responding is, is one of the response to the viral system. He has it for, been doing it for a long time. It's very interesting. Of course, a bunch of idiots behind that are saying, oh, but that's a deep state. They're going to make a, you know, a, global, uh, a global policy. Ah, come on, let's, let's face it. Well, there's another thing that people don't simply understand. We talk about digital transformation. Have you all heard about that expression, digital transformation? Transformation. What do you mean yes. by this? People call it the, the business world, uh, the engineers, uh, all the people who are working into how do you adapt uh, traditional businesses and traditional uh, public administration to the new media. It's called the digital transformation. Trans but what the people don't get is the real transformation, digital as well, is us. We are being digitally transformed. The way, you see, if you have studied the history of the alphabet the way I have, and, and so has Bob, we know that the alphabet penetrated us like a pharmacon. Derrida said the alphabet also penetrated people. It did. Well, algorithms are penetrating us now. That's a digital transformation. So... Yes, social media will be continuing to be used. They will be variegated. I'm very happy to hear uh, comments made by, by Howard about this. But this is the happy. It, it, what we're talking about is a whole systemic change, not some, something that's just a surface uh, issue. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's a, that's a great point. And I like the idea that the algorithm is the new alphabet. Uh, uh, shaping uh, uh, the way we... We are putting the, the stuff. Alphabet effect. Yes, Bob. it is, but... For my book, it's called The Alphabet Effect. Okay. <laughs> so, the yeah. argument that I want to finish, and then Bob can go on, but this is what sure. I want to say <laughs> about how the alphabet penetrated us and turned us into private person. What are we losing now? Privacy. We're not autonomous intellectually anymore or consciously. We are being penetrated by algorithms because algorithms make choices for us. When we use Alexa or, or digital assistant, it's actually making choices for us. So reducing the need for us to use our judgment. As far as memory is concerned, nobody remembers the phone the number of their you know, neighbor or friends or whatever. It's all, in the, it's all in their cell phone. In the cell phone is also the rest of my memory. So we have yeah. emigrated, we have pushed everything out of our cognitive tradition that came from the alphabet and those are being replaced by algorithms. We're becoming algorithmic creatures. Derek, I said it. <laughs> Marshall pointed out that all technology has both service and service. Alphabet created a lot of service. In fact, it allowed literacy to be everywhere in the world. Yes, of uh, course. So we have to take into account that we can't be Luddites about the alphabet. We have to use the technology, but be aware of its negative impacts. As Marshall pointed out, the alphabet creates an environment which is subliminal. And by you mentioning this 
fact that we work, think in terms of algorithms uh, makes us aware of that hidden environment. Yeah. And you are an artist and you have created an anti-environment and the anti-environment you created is to warn us not to become over algorithmized. If we can avoid it. <laughs> if we can avoid it. It's very I'd hard like to comment, resist. I'd like to comment on your remark about how you uh, haven't smelled a gasoline engine for a long while. Uh, there are now wild animals roaming many of the cities yeah. across the world. Yeah. Uh, people in Delhi can now see the Himalayans. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But one of the things that uh, this pandemic has brought home for me is it's made me aware of how much I love my family and my friends. Mm -hmm. Right now, my family, like your family, Derek, you have a kid in Japan, you have a kid in Ontario, you're in Italy. I got the same situation. I have a, you have a companion, at least with you in Italy. I got a wife in Romania. I got a stepson in Germany. I've got a son in Italy. My three daughters and my two granddaughters are here in Toronto. But my two grandsons are in Los Angeles. So I've been having experiencing social isolation from these people. And this pandemic makes you realize how valuable those relationships are. Now, you made another remark, which is bears amplification. When you said COVID is small potatoes compared to the coming of the uh, global warming climate change catastrophe that's due here in about 2050. I'm 80 years old, and so I'm not going to have to face that crisis. But for the young people, Andrew, McLuhan, and your children, they're going to have to deal with that situation. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why it's so serious. We survived the plague. We survived the Spanish flu. But the catastrophe of climate change could make the planet uninhabitable for humanity. We're not talking about, you know, 1%, 2% of our population dying. We're talking about life could not go on for humans. All that would survive would be the cockroaches. The cockroaches survived the hydrogen bomb testing on Bikini Island in the Pacific. The only hope for humanity is that those cockroaches will evolve and a new form of humanity will arise. Unless we do really confront the problem of global warming and climate change. And I hate to, you know, in this time when we're worrying so much about COVID, put another worry into your heads. But we're gonna survive the COVID thing. And when we do, I want all of you to work on this environmental problem. You're all responsible, especially those of you that are parents. I worry, it makes me sick thinking about what my grandchildren and children are gonna face. Uh, sorry to not be more upbeat, but this has to be said. And I wanna thank the people that uh, volunteered to help. Masood Eskandari has volunteered to help. I plan to contact a few of the other people that have positive things to say about the uh, new exploration project. Uh, I'm using this uh, gathering to further my projects. I hope you don't mind, Paulo. As usual. <laughs> no but problem. I think that's what this is all about. No problem. We are all explorers, right? So no, exactly. we are all, and we are um, uh, looking forward to see the birth of this new project, the new exploration uh, journal. And I think it's important to have a journal that, uh, to some extent, fosters uh, the legacy of uh, uh, McLuhan's uh, non-academic thinking, so not 
it's not gonna be an academic journal right it's more it's much more and beyond any any kind of academic journal so it's uh, we need to experiment and probe and um yes great i wanted to uh just um well uh as a side note from stephen doyle I, I swear the birds are happier than ever this spring. <laughs> and it's <laughs> really true. Yeah. They are. And uh, and so how can we how can we combine this uh ecosystem in terms of uh uh well going back uh, and, and finding new models for uh, for uh, an, an equilibrium between uh, between uh, us humans and the uh, environment what's your what's your take on this i oh. i would yeah. I, I, oh i thought you know it depends but um the idea of co-working is certainly you know living and, and working from your living place is certainly one that's going to sort of continue the effect that we're getting, we'll be getting more used to. <laughs> uh, I, no, I, I, I believe that. And we're not, this is not the, this is just the first time we are locked down. And you're not finished with it. France is not finished with it. Uh, we are, but we are not finished with it even ourselves, because as I said, the danger now is much greater, I think, than before the lockdown. And by the way, so, this is your probe, uh... Yeah. Breakdown has breakthrough. So well, yeah, this is a great McLuhan one because uh, McLuhan, if it's one which you could also borrow from the Chinese, you know, uh, crisis is the time of opportunity. Or the word crisis is actually meaning the same thing. I think the breakdown is, let's say, the lockdown is our breakdown, but it's a breakthrough because we fall back on ourselves, we reflect on ourselves. Uh, I'm sure, for example, that. All three of us are writers, and for us, it's as uh, was said also by Harvard, it's an opportunity. And we realize that for us, it's maybe not that big a change, but we have to take account of kids, you know, 12, 15 years old who are locked into their place. That, that's really, really difficult. So, breakdown as breakthrough is much harder for them than it is for us. But eventually, what we've been discussing before, that this breakdown is going to change our attitude towards the biggest danger that is facing us, uh, that's the, what I consider big the breakthrough. So it's, it's, it's by having been, see, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's, we're all into slow motion, and it's the whole thrust of the civilization guided by the economy has been stopped in its tracks. And we're not only looking at ourselves being stopped, we're looking at the world being stopped. We're looking at streets which don't have cars. Well, not here, but we're looking at all, we are looking at, at the world in, in a still form. Like it's not a nature mort, but almost. So that kind of emotion that comes out of that is the one that leads to the breakthrough. Wait a minute, there's, there's a message here. Right, so, you know, say, what's the message of the coronavirus? That's the message. The message of the lockdown, the lockdown itself is a message of corona coronavirus, but the lockdown itself is also the message of the climate change uh, threat. And what's going to be the flip, Derek? Ha! I think the flip is going to be coming back to the Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> no, coronavirus <laughs> retrieved the plague. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. We have retrieved the plague. Um, but no, you're right. The flip is should be, should be the solution that we find the, la the the light at the end of the tunnel, and I think that uh, as I said, it's not going to happen this time, but it will happen because we're as a the social body is quite intelligent. It's extremely stupid right now. We have incredible. We're back into the time of the absurd. We have an absurd president of the United States. Absurd <laughs> president. No, we really do. Absurd in the sense that if you wanted to make a play about a complete idiot, idiot running a country as powerful as the United States, you would be find better than the character we have up there. And that well, Boris Johnson gives him a run for the money. Yes, he shook he, hands with everybody and contracted the, the virus. 
I know that was a very, a very great political move on his part. Yes, but, <laughs> I would say, <laughs> but it's it's a what it is. We are in a transition period now. Remember that between the uh, the arrival of the printing press and the and modernity, we had two hundred years of uh, religious wars. Now, because things are much faster, we are going to go to a few decades of this tremendously difficult transition that we're going through right now. That's for sure. But it is the same problem. The adaptation time it takes for a culture to get to understand its new condition, that is the fact that's, that is now being happening. Uh, and somebody says here, the social body is not intelligent. No, not like this taken by like pieces, but overall, yes, I'm sure it's gonna resist well and I'm very confident. The thing is, I might not be there because I'm over 70, and of course, I'm going to catch coronavirus. <laughs> right. Um, no, thank you, Derek. Thank you. And by the way, so I wanted to uh, puzzle and foster uh, a little bit our folks. Uh, I wanted to foster our folks uh, out there. Uh, and uh, may, so I first, may I first just point out something? Brilliant, Derek uh, has done with the uh, breakdown. Sure, break sure, sure. That breakdown. Just before your just before your comments. So, uh, folks uh, on Facebook and YouTube, uh, please share your questions, share your short comments. I'll pick it, uh, them all, and uh, so we can, yeah, let you come into the discussion. So, Bob, you were saying sorry. I've I've been very dire. I've been painting horrible pictures end of humanity. And Derek came up with something that's very upbeat with the remark of breakthrough through breakdown. And that is the great hope. I also want to let people know that Derek proposed that in the New Explorations Journal that we devote an issue to the uh, COVID pandemic and the lessons we learned from it. So I'm inviting all the listeners to this uh, uh, people podcast or video cast to uh, please think about what you have learned from the COVID pandemic and what recommendations you might have for how we can go through to create the breakthrough through this breakdown. Good. Thank you, Derek, for those wonderful words. Well, thank you for supporting the. <laughs> You're so brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so are you, Paulo. So I'm, how about I'm a big hand for Paulo for having well, done no. this? I'm impressed yes. by the extent. No, no, thank you, thank you. But I'm impressed by the extent of a uh, um, frank discussion that we are having tonight. Uh, and well, that's why I wanted to start this Monday night webinar. So, so I really missed. Uh, uh, this sense of dialogue, engaging conversations, uh, real one-to-one, -one, one to many dialogues and conversations. So we, this is what makes us uh, humans, right? So we need to uh, instantaneously exchange ideas. Uh, and why we exchange ideas, uh, we change uh, who we are. So to some extent, uh, we really need these uh, real-time conversations online, offline, in person, on the web, wherever. But it's important that we do foster this kind of uh, um, maoietic uh, thinking. So the, the idea that thinking together, resonating each other. So I really missed that. Uh, uh, that's why a few weeks ago, no, a few weeks ago, last week, actually, 10 days ago, <laughs> I, had the, I had the idea, okay, <laughs> let's start the Monday Night Webinar. So let, let's do okay. something. So we need to absolutely absolutely uh, foster the sense of a uh, community it was brilliant. engagement it was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. But, you know and, you know what you should what you should say is that you have two here members of the first try of continuing the monday night seminar remember bob yes eric, eric myself and you we all three got together and we continued as soon as it was the after the it was during the 1981 uh, 1881, when uh, Marshall had just died, and we said, "Well, if the university is not taking it, why don't we?" And we went, and I think it lasted almost two years. The, uh, we lost the, the coach house because they closed down McLuhan Center. Mm. They took away the coach house, 
So we went to St. Michael's College. Brennan Hall. We went into Carr Hall in the basement. Yeah. And we were like the early Christians in the catacombs. <laughs> reviving <laughs> the McLuhan seminars. <laughs> and Apollo, uh, I have one recommendation. I know July 11th is the last for this edition, but in September. No, actually. No, no. I, beg you, I beg you. To resume these Monday night seminars next fall. Webinars, webinars. So actually, the last one, Bob and Fox, uh, you all, the last one will be July the 21st, which is Marshall McLuhan's birthday. So I'm, I'm trying to, I'll be hopefully in Italy um, in July. So from Italy, I like to, uh, this is a premier uh, uh, news. So I like to organize a <laughs> Monday night marathon because we are people yeah. all across the world. I, I, I just saw Maria Perganti from Athens. So it's, uh, it's uh, four or five a.m. in Athens. So we, we have, a, we have a, the power of doing a international marathon, Monday night marathon. McLuhan Monday Night Marathon, July the 21st, starting uh, sometime in Italy, uh, maybe 8 p.m., and we cross all the time zones uh, for 24 hours, okay? So to celebrate Jan uh, July the 21st, uh, Marshall McLuhan's birthday, as a symbolical McLuhan Day for uh, the Global Villa, the Global Village Day, right? It may be yeah, the Global Village right. Day. The Monday night uh, marathon. So you all uh, or you are all invited to join the final marathon. Okay, are you in, <laughs> Bob, Derek? Right. We're in. Absolutely. Okay. We're in. Now, uh, but also, but Paolo, what about next September? Please September. I'll, I'll, let, let me see. Let me see because September is going to be very busy for me. I'll be teaching, and, uh, and nobody knows what's going well, on. Well, maybe you do it that. only once a month. But you must continue this. Yeah, the idea is that, uh, again, so this is an attempt to balance the state of isolation. My hope is that in September we will be able to gather again in person. Okay, so this is a, let's say... But if we do uh, gather in person, we could still have this uh, broadcast uh, studio you created. Yes. And bring other people from around the world into a Monday night seminar. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, why not? Totally. I want to see Derek back at Monday night seminars in Nepal. <laughs> yeah. But again, so the idea that the webinars are an online gathering and we can take advantage of the time zones for inventing something new. I, I like to think of this uh, gathering tonight as an experimental uh, format, okay? So mm -hmm. experimenting with the possibilities. Even what we cannot do in person, we can do it online. In fact, Talking about what we cannot uh, do in person, but maybe online, I have a, an experiment. So I give you an opportunity, my friends, Bob and Derek. And people, folks from Facebook and YouTube can uh, uh, help Bob and Derek to get inspired for this very special uh, medium experiment. It's called the medium experiment. So it is. I give you, I give you, I give you a chance. Bob uh, <clears throat> first, Bob, Bob first, and then Derek. I give you a chance, Bob. You start to. I'll, uh, okay, I give you a chance, Bob, to talk to Marshall McLuhan. Let's pretend you were able now, thanks to my special uh, effects here, to talk to Marshall. So you have to turn your face right this way. Turn your face, okay. Wait, I gotta do something else. Uh, Just why? like Woody Allen, I happen to have Marshall McLuhan oh, right hold here on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, okay, this is Marshall, so. No, no, wait a second. Here we go. I have Marshall McLuhan right here with me. I'm going to do the same trick that Woody Allen did. Go ahead. Give me this a moment to get this set up. Okay, this is history, my friends. Uh, uh, and by the way, all right, what's going on there? There's a beautiful painting, McLuhan and Bob Logan there. Yes, I agree with Bob, but please continue if possible. This painting was done by my wife. Maria Yelensky Logan from a photograph of me and Marshall. 
And uh, the photograph was taken during the time Marshall was still suffering from his stroke. And so Maria put a smile on his face. And so Marshall McLuhan is right here now, and I'll be able to talk to him. In the meantime, here are some of the other paintings of my wife for you folks to look at. And now my remarks to Marshall. Marshall, your ideas are alive and well in this world. The heritage that you gave us is a precious gift that we all value. The journal New Explorations and my cataloging of your videos is an attempt to keep your spirit alive among us. I'm 80 years old now, and I'm going to soon join you in the media ecology heaven. But in the meantime, I'm going to spend the rest of my life making sure that people become aware of what you have, the gift you have given us. I mentioned a few of them. The idea that um, that technology gives both service and disservice. Uh, Derek came up with a couple of absolutely essential remarks. Breakthrough through breakdown. So Marshall, I thank you for your contribution and uh, I love you still. We all love you. I also want to mention that the uh, your daughter Terry uh, is a great inspiration to me. The idea to catalog the videos of uh, your videos came as a result of a conversation I had with uh, Terry McLuhan, Isabella Prisca Oldenhoff. We were on a Zoom call together, and I realized that both uh, Isabella and Terry are filmmakers. And then we came up with the idea that we should catalog Marshall's videos. And that's how that came about. So Marshall, you live through your daughter, Terry, and your other children, Michael McLuhan, who's a, a great warrior, your grandson, Andrew, um, and all your other children that have contributed to keeping your uh, heritage alive and keeping your contribution alive for us all. Those are my words, Derek. And uh, may I say, may say you, thank you for giving me the opportunity. No problem. I, I wanted to. Derek. All right. Thank you, Bob. Amen. I will say at the, at the very end, Amen. <laughs> so, it's more good. Uh, all right. All right. All right. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you don't mind. So now, I mean, that was a, that was, okay. Very, um, uh, impressive Bob's uh, statement. Uh, I expect something uh, uh, different from Derek, but I don't know. I don't know. Uh, by the way, uh, all right, let me put on the medium here face. Okay, your turn, Derek. Yeah. <laughs> it may be, hold on, hold on, hold on. It may be a confession. It may, no. be, uh, it may be it may be a question. It what may is be it? a statement. It may be uh, anyway, your, your your call, your call. <laughs> Well, all I can say, I, I can't really talk directly to a photograph, but I can. <laughs> all right, all right. I know, but I'm, I'm having a trouble doing that. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, I can. that's perfect, 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 perfect. Okay, that's okay. All right. No, I really have a difficulty uh, talking to a photograph. <laughs> so, um, but I know that there is, what was it? Mainlining. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an expression uh, that I... Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, so you know, we're supposed to we're supposed to uh, ask it like in a spiritual a spirit way. Uh, I, and if I were to do that, my question would be this one: uh, Please, Marshall, can you explain to us why the the planet, instead of coming together to deal with a problem which was global, just all split all apart? That's that means I have I have. I cannot understand how I can understand why crazy people running countries, but I can't understand why the European community, which has been achieved at such great cost with such success, could have been so completely thrown off by this thing. Now, I don't understand it, but this is the kind of thing you, dear Marshall, <laughs> knew perfectly well. Anybody there could answer my question? Uh, let's see everybody there. 
Let's see the comments. Uh, so step in the comments, folks. Uh, Jean-François Vallée channeling. So yes, we are channeling. channeling exactly. That's the channel, word. That's, okay. that's the word. The channel. I'm not the, good at the this. Medium, of course. <laughs> the medium and channeling, right? Uh, which is uh, makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. And uh, well, uh, folks, step in. Step in. You can uh, answer Derek's uh, question. Uh, Clinton. Uh, the large hidden ground of the new environment how the way that the old one of television popularized the social media sites ah well that's a point now that's a point why we can jump on that because that's exactly what's missing the era of tv was an era of social cohesion that social cohesion isn't yeah. there anymore yeah. and we've lost we've lost we've lost that ground so it's that I'm glad that uh, Clinton came up with this uh, suggestion because it's one of the one of the most difficult things right now about social media. It destroyed social yeah. media. And in fact, Jean Francois says uh, it's paradoxical that such a global phenomenon has created the closing off absolutely of the states. Yeah. So there you see. <laughs> Marshall can't answer himself. There are all kind of people to do it for him. I've been doing <laughs> that all my life. <laughs> hey, Joel. Hi. Uh, who else? Who else? So, and there are many. I saw a few other comments. Uh, and mm, mm, Troy, by the way, Troy. Yes, can you have Corey Anton? Yeah, Corey will join us uh, in a few weeks. So don't don't worry. So I put together a lot of people and friends for the for the for the seminars all right all right all right all right uh this is again uh, jean francois but the, but some nation states like us seem to be falling apart the state and city governments are taking over the Kremlin federal state in fact actually yes yeah, cities are going to play are going to play such a major uh, role uh, into this brand new world after a post uh, uh, pandemic so cities uh, uh, are really going to count uh, uh, more right i think mm -hmm. in this global scenario and uh oh, oh, oh yes 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 read three balancations oh i like folks that finally you're stepping in folks go on go on <laughs> uh, retribalization leads to abrasive encounters so we still have the weakness of literate men yeah, susceptibly good. to propaganda and uh thank you who was that uh Tyler, Tyler Newman, Tyler Newman, Tyler Newman. Uh, 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 um, uh, Facebook in nearly every country run by a woman, president or prime minister, the country has fared far better through this pandemic. Through this pandemic, a few were that's a quicker organized, better organized responses. And so that's another point. Uh, uh, women uh, leadership and women, women uh, empowerment in this. Um, um, moment so there are issues in terms of uh, gender equality still and uh, I think that's another topic uh, uh, risen by the by the um, the current state of emergency the role of women uh, in society and leadership particularly well that's a good point that's a very good point and the other thing which is interesting of course is that the Asian countries have fared generally better than the West in the context of fighting the virus because actually they allowed much more, uh, while we worry about the privacy invasion of privacy in Italy, for example, they have a new application called Immuni that they are going to be using to make sure that we know who's where and we are contact. In the, in the Asian countries which th that are uh, community oriented, none of this makes a major problem, including social credits in China. So it's kind of, it's kind of interesting that uh, we, as very strongly individualized uh, cultures, have found it much harder to let ourselves be guided by a system like this because we are terrified of uh, non-democratic, autocratic kind of governments. But that's a point. You know, it, it, we should know what are the different cultural grounds in which the corona coronavirus is being handled. And the idea that women do a better, a better job at it is absolutely clear. New Zealand is, is somehow through with the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's because of Jacinda Ardern. So it's, uh, that's, a good, that's a very good point.
Absolutely, absolutely. And by the way, I like to point out that Joel, uh, say, cities uh, play a major role uh, always uh, since 20 years. That, yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's why I'm an advocate of the uh, cities' uh, uh, role in society. And the idea that the global population currently, 50% of the global population uh, live in cities. Uh, and mm. But in the following years, uh, even more uh, uh, people will live in the city so that's why we need to seriously think uh, how uh, cities can uh, yeah keep playing a very important role into this global uh, scenario donald trump is pushing uh, the united states to the city state yeah, yeah he's, he's doing it he's actually dividing the country in so many ways that eventually yeah. it will re re it, it's going to stop being united just like united kingdom is not really united anymore mm. Mm, that's the true. United thing is very, that's the whole question. This, 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 the, the crux of the matter is that are we still united? What's united today? Yeah, same with Europe, right? What's exactly. what's united the Europe, the United States of Europe, right? Uh, yeah, again, there's a question from um, Taylor Conspiracy theories are rampant right now. Why? Fear and ability to understand a complex environment. What's your uh, maybe Bob and uh, and Derek? What's your uh, what's your um, take on this conspiracy theories? It's definitely fear. Derek People cannot face but, the reality. You, well, that's and they have to blame somebody. And the real blame, as we have just pointed out, others have pointed out. Is the blame is with us that we don't think about the future. We always live for the moment. And we the, capitalism encourages a consumer society. And we're destroying our planet and we're making the planet unsafe so that a, a virus, a microscopic entity, can bring us to our knees. I think right. conspiracy theory. Derek. Cons the conspiracy theory goes well with echo chambers. We know that, that you feed into the people. And by what it is, it's a new form of gossip. On, on social media, gossip is not that interested or doesn't interest enough about this affair that this person is having with another person or uh, problems at the office and all. That's boring. The really exciting stuff that's really juicy is, is conspiracy theory. It's a new form of gossip. People actually enjoy it. They enjoy pushing it. They enjoy uh, making it viral. Uh, bad news really sell better <laughs> than good news. And as McLuhan said, it takes a lot of good news to sell bad, uh, sell the bad news. Oh, it takes a lot of bad news to sell the good news of advertising yeah. in newspaper. Well, that's what the same spirit is behind that. Gossip is actually the kind of bad news that get people excited. Hmm. And and that's what's yeah. happening. Engagement, excitement. People yeah. are not very bright. If somebody said that the, uh, the population is stupid, yes, in that way, absolutely. It's just that I see that there is a natural way of trying to save yourself from the mess you're in. But the fact is, people are not very bright. And somebody comes up, they, they don't know anything. <laughs> so gossip uh, and, and, and uh, th you know, conspiracy theories are very easy to go unchecked. I, I call about, I mean, this is for the semioticians among you. I'm saying we are living into the worst epistemological crisis of all times. Because right now, people like Trump and others, all they have to do is to connect a statement and its potential response. It has nothing to do with what's called a referent. In a, in a, in a semiotic triangle, of a, meaning is made by a signifier, a signified, and a referent. Today we've gotten rid of the referent. We don't have to say that there were many people at the opening and inauguration of, uh, from the time of Trump came in, we started getting rid of the referent. We could see that the mall was filled with more people at Obama's inauguration than at the one of, of Trump. But, you know, uh, Shelly Ann Conway, my fave, I'm just, I'm madly in love with Shelly Ann Conway, said, no, 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 this, we have an alternate truth about this. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah. But this is what it is. We, we are dealing now where subjectivity and objectivity are not separate anymore. 
There used to be a time when you could trust that there was a world out there. Now, even I'm, I'm studying nuclear physics right now, and particularly uh, mm. the new uh, uh, quantum mechanics. Well, quantum mechanics is just in a situation where is reality still there when you're not looking at it? This is a big question. Even Einstein had a problem with that. So yeah, this is exactly, we're in an era of epistemological crisis where we don't need to prove anything, where in fact, it will also be taken over by algorithms because algorithms are going to create the new objectivity. There was a time when science was objective, but you know, now you don't have to have science anymore. Algorithms are going to be objective. They will decide, but they will decide for a mass of people who, who don't have any more reference to be able to fight the algorithms. I see. I see. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And well, it's time. It's ten. Uh, it's ten p.m. Derek. Uh, oh yeah, and, and right. Four a.m. in either. I'm on a roll. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, you can go out and take a cornetto and cappuccino. Or yeah, right, right. Two minutes. Go back to sleep. Oh, go back to sleep. <laughs> All right. But it's ten. M, it's ten p.m. Uh, time to time to finish. Be um, just let me. Uh, right, give you the word for a very, very, very brief final remarks from Bob and Derek. Uh, Bob, your final remarks for uh, tonight's uh, uh, webinar. Paulo, thank you so much for having uh, created this forum. Uh, I want to thank the people that uh, responded positively to my suggestions. Please send me your your emails so I can send you the uh, list of videos that are accessible and the uh, hidden explorations. God love all of us. God, thank you. I want everybody to stay safe, stay well, and stay happy. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Bob. Derek, your final remarks from Italy. From, from my experience of this event uh, this evening, uh, it's, I think it's very, very rich and will become richer. I, I understand your reluctance to immediately go say yes to Bob's suggestion that we should just keep going and do that all the time. But the fact that we can connect with people uh, across the planet is really richer than when we were all together stuck from their own, our same city. And I think that I, I have felt much more comfortable within this situation than I was when I was running them with Bob at the time. I thought, this is, this is richer. This is better. I like this. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, let's but do thank it. You, Paolo. Let's do it, Paolo. <laughs> In an age of physical uh, distancing, uh, so put your hands on the camera. So let's touch. Uh, let's keep in touch. <laughs> okay? Let's keep in touch. We can touch each other. That's what, uh, folks, uh, Tom, you can do the same. So, yeah, your camera is on. Maybe who knows? So let's start. Let's keep it. Let's keep it in touch. And my final. Uh, uh, I kiss you all, break. everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much to Bob Logan, Derek De Kirkhoff, and all people at home. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, for uh, joining us tonight, uh, um, commenting, uh, showing, sharing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You did a great job so to really uh, gather ideas all together. And a final, very, very final remarks about our next Modern Essay webinar, May the 11th, Donna Harper, Jesse Hirsch, Mark Lipton and Phil Rose. So, thank you, my friends. Thank you, Global Village. I love you so much. Stay safe and stay sage. Buona <laughs> notte. Bye. Everybody. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Arrivederci. <laughs> <laughs>